Well, I've dialed this number and I am led to believe that Fiona Boys of Fiona Boys and the Fortune Tellers and Fiona Boys is on the line. Hi, Fiona. G'day. How are you doing, Rusty? I am indeed here. You are. Um, and thank you very much for uh, agreeing to talk to us because I know things are starting to open up again. So, you know, you must be getting quite busy now, are you? Yeah, I am. Look, it's it's great that um, that things are opening up again. And of course, you know, we've all been hanging out. We miss you all. We miss the audiences and the opportunity to play. You know, for me, being a musician is, um, you know, it's great to play in the studio. It's great to play for yourself. But there's something magical that happens when you get to play for an audience. And that's, that's really where it's at for me. So, yeah, I'm enjoying the opportunity yeah. to um, start getting out again. And, and I saw you uh, and the fortune tellers at uh, Blues on Broadbeach a few weeks ago. And I, I must say that there were smiles on the faces of not just you and your band, but every band that was on the stage and all the audience. Everyone was just so into having live music again. Yeah, I think it was it was actually really interesting because I think some of these uh, big events now that we're having starting to have the opportunity to to gather again is really important because one of the things that I think blues does really well is kind of engender this community. And I know that certainly I saw um, I saw blues fans and extended sort of family and uh, I call them my blues family. You know, I saw people from really all over people that I'd met at festivals in Darwin and um, originally, of course, I'm from Melbourne, so regional people from Victoria, you know, all over. It was it was really great to have that opportunity, you know, to, to see people and also my band because I, you know, while everything was in lockdown, um, you know, I'm originally from Melbourne and my, my fortune tellers, my band is in Melbourne, so we didn't have, you know, we didn't get a chance to see each other or play for a year. Um, Not although at all. we were doing sort of virtual collaborations. And right. Things, yeah. I had heard that there was a couple of uh, virtual sort of collaborations going on. Um, and so, as you're talking about sort of the lockdown and the separation from live music, how did you cope with that and being away from your band? What, what did you do? How did you fill your time? <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, I, I do play with my band and I absolutely adore the opportunity to play with them. They're great players and it's a, it's just a delight. But I do a lot of solo uh, shows, of course, as well. And and that also accounts for a lot of my international touring. Um, so, yeah, it was strange because I had, uh, you know, four months or so of international touring that had to be cancelled. I was supposed to be in America from um, June and July last year, uh, August in Canada, and then later in the year in Norway. Um, but like a lot of musicians, we're a cunning bunch of creatives. I threw myself into a lot of uh, projects, and I've, I always have more projects on the burner than I can actually kind of get around to doing, but I'd had this idea to release uh, well, re-release my very first solo album, which was recorded in, in 2000, direct to um, analog tape. And I thought this was a kind of a fun synchronicity to do a 20th year celebration re-release in 2020. And uh, so I had remastered the album and, and that was some of the touring that I had planned in America was to launch that material um, over there but yeah. what ended up happening was I thought well now I actually have the time and space to really um, dig into this and I ended up um, spending the my initial lockdown trolling through these files and boxes and stuff I had literally carried around for 20 years and uh, decided to make this reissue um, sort of significant by putting together a 24 page booklet to go with the album, which has sort of got diary notes, photos, memories, kind of really, you know, what got me to record that album in the first place and how it informed my blues adventures um, for, for the next couple of decades. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think I would have been able to really dig in and do such a good job of that if I hadn't had the time and, and space to do it, you know? Yeah, I also heard... Uh 
or rather I read in an interview uh, that you did quite recently that um, you you were leading a, a songwriter a blue songwriting class for some uh, young people is that correct was that am I right here yes yeah well that was the other thing you know I had um, a few uh, sort of I don't generally teach you know sort of like a lot of musicians will you know have sort of a weekly roster of, I don't do so much of that sort of teaching but I I do um, uh, teach at special events and so some of those were um, were new that were because there was the need to put things into you know virtual platforms I, I did a songwriting uh uh, wrote up some sessions and presented them for a youth in music initiative um, in regional South Australia, and uh, and also the first gigs that I was supposed to be doing um, physically last year in America. One of uh, an important one for me is uh, the Pine Top Perkins Foundation. Pine Top, of course, was a legendary Delta piano player who played with Money Waters and everybody else, <laughs> and there's a foundation in his name uh, which uh, does a couple of things, mainly um, sort of youth in blues and uh, focusing on young musicians at the beginning of their careers. And also uh, a, a part of the foundation is to uh, help elderly musicians, you know, later in their career if they're having troubles. But the Pine Top Foundation does guitar master classes. Well, they do master classes over several instruments um, in Mississippi. And, uh, and I, have been the guitar instructor there for the past few years, which is an incredible honour, you know, for for a woman, you know, because the blues guitar scene is quite male dominated, and also for a non-American. So uh, that we ended out transitioning those guitar master classes online last year, and and this year I've just finished teaching again. Um, it, it almost killed me because because of the time differences, I was having to get up at I was having to get up at four thirty in the morning so I could be sufficiently caffeinated and sparky to pontificate by six o'clock in the morning um, online. So. I'm sure I'm sure they all all appreciated it and so so let me therefore we're talking about young people here here, here and now. Let's take you back just for a, a few minutes to your youth. Um, I understand you were sort of quite a latecomer to the music industry. Um, how, how did that come about? Um, why, did you, why did the blues genre fall on you? Well, I, really, it was I fell in love with blues first. You know, that was, uh, I, I discovered blues really, I guess, a lot of us are hearing blues and not knowing it, of course, because there's a strong thread of, of blues in so much uh, popular music. But when I really sort of hit the mother load was when I got to, to college and there was a very active folk and blues club on campus. And um, the guy who was running that was really into uh, a lot of classic blues. So I suddenly heard documentary recordings from the 20s and 30s and classic Chicago blues from the 50s and I just just fell in love with it and um, pretty much became a huge blues fan and went to see you know as many gigs as I could and a lot of American artists were touring through Melbourne at the time and so it was yeah it was not until uh, later in my mid to late 20s that I sort of uh, I laugh and say I had my midlife crisis earlier. I, I sort of, um, I borrowed a guitar and I, I'd only been playing for about a year and I, I took myself off to an open mic night at a coffee shop and and the next thing you know, I was I was dreadfully nervous to start with, but I just loved the music so much and I wanted to have a go and and that, that was the start of it. Wow. Um, and you, you're talking there about uh, picking up at college uh, and and sort of seeing and hearing the blues and delving into them. And you're almost like a student of the blues in the fact that you don't restrict yourself to one or two genres. You do slide. You know, you look at the your, your sort of the wiki and, and everyone quotes that you do Mississippi Hills, Pied Piedmont Finger Picking, New Orleans Barrel House. Memphis Soul, classic Chicago blues, Texas swing, uptown West Coast. 
it's almost like you're still a student and, and, and taking it all on board still, all these years later. Well, Yes, it is. And I find it endlessly fascinating. You know, I, I think a lot of people think of blues as a fairly narrow uh, genre. And, uh, you know, people have, you know, you, sometimes you meet people that, you know, what do you do? I, I'm a blues musician. And they sort of think of that as, as fairly limited or derivative. But, you know, what, what I find really exciting as a musician and a songwriter um, is, is all these different regional styles of blues and all these different, and even sometimes where the, some of the um, regional styles sort of blur. Um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of twang in Texas blues and, and uh, you know, melodic swampy stuff in Louisiana blues. It's, there's all these different um, styles and I, I find it interesting to explore. And, uh, you know, I, I started out, of course, as a uh, country blues acoustic finger picker, so really very influenced by um, by people like um, Mississippi John Hurt and Big Bill Brunsey and um, Tommy Johnson, a lot of those um, players that were that really um, were popular and came out of that that folk blues revival in the sixties and seventies. Uh, and of course, in Melbourne, our very own godfather of the blues, uh, Dutch Tilders, yep. was really important because, um, you know, I was listening to this, this stuff on, you know, bootleg tapes and cassette tapes and vinyl and stuff. But, but Dutch was the first time I saw a real live musician um, playing in a small club. And you, I just remember thinking, oh, wow. Imagine being able to do that. You know, and now so, you are. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and that's, so I started out with the acoustic stuff and I guess that felt more accessible to me. You know, I, I love the classic Chicago stuff, but it seems so masculine and electric. And um, so, you know, over the years, uh, I, I started, you know, a couple of years after I started playing out and about, with the acoustic country blues stuff, I had an opportunity to join a band. And so I thought, oh, well, I better borrow an electric. I don't know how that <laughs> works, but I better get one of those if I'm going to be in a band. So, you know, each step along the way, there's been these moments. Recently, I've been really inspired by spending more time again in Mississippi and uh, exploring and starting to collect some of these crazy one-off cigar box instruments, which... Is uh, is another interesting journey because it's almost like everything you know about guitar you can throw it away. It's the joy of those instruments is in fact their limitations. You've only got a couple of notes, you know, three yep. strings and two notes, and and it, it it strips everything down to something that's very essential, uh, which is uh, really interesting too. Yeah, and. Uh... It's also interesting that you are the artist that covers your guitars with with the colourful uh, designs that they uh, that you come up with. Um, you're the <laughs> artist as well, not just the playing artist, but also the the conceptual artist that designs the colour scheme. I'm right, aren't I? Am I right? That's right. I have got a couple of uh, these cigar boxes that I've hand painted, and and actually that's another thing that. I was um, increasingly been interested and in messing around with in recent years uh, is the the connection, um, particularly in places like uh, New Orleans and in uh, parts of Mississippi, is that a lot of the musicians are folk artists and vice versa. And uh, so I started um, doing my version of Mississippi style folk art. Uh, which has been really fun, and I've also so that's another thing I've been I was doing in lockdown was was doing more artwork and um, and selling some of that too. Um, I've also been selling, putting prints and and um, and artwork on my merch table along with the albums. Hey, uh, yeah. why ever not? <laughs> it's <all> good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it start it started out actually because. Um, a few albums ago, I'd, I'd been on the road a lot and I'd, um, it was, I guess, 2016. I, um, 
I released an acoustic album through an audio file label in California called Reference Recordings. And it was quite intense because the recording required to, to suit the audio file um, technique and everything had to be live. And um, it was just like one take. You couldn't do any overdubs. You couldn't have monitors, no live electronics in the studio space, um, you know, natural reverb in the room. It was really, really pretty intense recording session. So I'd been on the road a lot. I'd been touring. I'd been practicing. I'd been playing heaps leading up to this recording session. And I flew home from California and as soon as I got home, I had to have finger surgery. I'd uh, developed a bone spur in uh, my left index finger, which is a bit vital for playing guitar. And it was, um, it was making it difficult for me to bend that finger. So it meant that I was suddenly, I, I was you know, musically incapacitated and, and uh, I couldn't play for about eight weeks and had my finger in a comedically uh, ridiculously huge bandage and elevated and all this sort of stuff. So I ended up doing pieces of um, folk art themed on the songs from the session that I just recorded. And um, I ended up sharing them with the record label and they really liked them. So they ended up incorporating some of that artwork into the liner notes of the album. And, and it's, it's sort of taken off from there. Hey, um, why not? Um, you know, people, people <laughs> like, like Ron Wood in the Rolling Stones, he's, you know, his art is almost as famous uh, as his music. Well, it's just, uh, I guess it's, um, it's, a, it's very enjoyable for me and it's, uh, I guess it's just another aspect of creativity, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's started to, you know, creep into more of the, the, um, certainly the, the package designs on my album covers and, and liner notes and things like that too. So awesome. I get a great deal of enjo enjoyment out of, out of doing, messing around with this stuff. <laughs> okay. So now let's get back to, here we are coming up to Blues Fest in October. Finally, here we go. Um, who's in the fortune tellers this time around? Who's coming up to help you at Blues Fest? Well, the Fortune Tellers is a, is a trio. So it's my drummer, Mark Grundon, um, and Tim Neal on Hammond. So it's a Hammond trio, but Tim also, Tim's a multi-instrumentalist. In fact, on my last Electric album, uh, an American cr critic nicknamed him the Swiss Army Knife uh, <laughs> because on that particular album, Voodoo in the Shadows, he plays... Uh, Hammond, which is he's mostly known for, Hammond and piano and electric bass and uh, baritone sax. Okay. Um, on a couple of tracks. So, uh, but, but I look what's really good, sorry? I was about to say, I look forward to seeing him do that song at, uh, at Blues Fest, <laughs> you know? Is he an octopus or a, a spider, he this can't. dude? No, he can't do them all at once. <laughs> so, so normally he's either playing... Um, electric bass or Hammond um, when we're, we're playing the live show as a trio. But what is really great, and you, you know, you asked me before about my songwriting and, and about the range of styles of blues that I, that I like to play. What's really wonderful about these guys is they're, they're really talented and they, it's a conversation. It's always a musical conversation. So that when we when we get together and play, particularly in these precious moments now, when when you know we can particularly play a great um, festival like Byron on a big stage, is that that Mark is a great uh, drum kit player, but but he also is a good hand percussionist, and he's um, played with Bad Boys Batacada. He has a samba school, so. He's re he really likes exploring kind of weird bits of percussion. So we can go we can go from washboard and rag timey sort of stuff through to you know sometimes he'll just bring along like a bunch of chains and a conga and so we can get really swampy things and play the cigar boxes and cool. and Tim can and Tim can be on on bass. But then you can do something maybe New Orleans or Uptown or Swing and you've got the full Hammond and you've got the full drum kit. So, you know, it means 
it gives me, especially from the point of view of a trio, a wonderful musical palette to work with, you know. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's great. we look forward to seeing those. But also, um, you're also doing this solo uh, set at Blues Fest as well. Ah, uh, yes, that's where, you know, there's just me and some foot percussion and a mess of cigar boxes and stuff. It's, um, yeah, I, I, I like having the opportunity to also present a solo show. And I think it's another thing that takes me back to the very roots of the music. Uh, because, you know, back, back in the day, and I've had a chance to play some of these uh, funky juke joint sort of places in Mississippi, you know, one musician would be expected to, to, to play in, in a way that would be full enough and rhythmic enough for people to dance to. And, um, and so I like the challenge of playing solo. It's, um, it really means that, you know, you, you're trying to do bits of bass line, bits of fill, bits of melody. And it's like, if you're not playing, you better be singing. And if you're not singing or playing, you better be talking. It's a very uh, wonderful, intense kind of way of playing. So it's, it's going to be fun to, to do both styles of shows at, at Byron. Well, uh, Fiona, we're certainly hanging out to see you and certainly hanging out for, you know, everyone to get up here. Is, I don't know whether you've had a chance to look at our lineup. Is there anyone you, if you have, is there anyone you're hanging out to see or catch up with that you haven't seen for a while? Well, you know, I, to be honest, I haven't even had a chance to have a really good look. It's, everything's been sort of um, flying by. So that was um, kind of on my, on my list now that I've got past the, the 4.30 in the morning <laughs> um, getting up for the up thing um, last the last week or two. Cool. Well, we for, yeah, we forgive you for there, that then. But there's always a fantastic lineup, and I was just actually listening to to Jimmy Barnes's interview um, that you did, and it's, it's it's really interesting to see how people are in different headspaces from normal because everybody's been having to dig into their creativity in various ways. So I think it's going to be a really celebratory, wonderful festival. Oh, actually, and I'm really looking forward to it. We, and we're looking forward to you, Fiona, and we certainly hope that it is just going to be a massive celebration of live music and beautiful music across. And of course, it's all Australian. It, it, you know, we can't get finer than this, I don't think. I think that's really great to have the opportunity to focus on on the Australian talent because, you know, particularly when you get a chance to, to play and tour internationally, um, you know, people ask, you know, what's the blues scene like in Australia or, or whatever, particularly Americans, I think. It's, it's funny that I think they're often quite surprised at how, you know, what started out as a particularly uh, uniquely American um, an Afro-American art form has become so universal and, and so globally loved and played. So people are often su surprised, oh, there's a blues scene. Oh, yes, there's a, there's a great blues scene in Australia and a very talented and diverse range of acts. So, yeah, it's going to be really great and to be able to, to dig in. While we're on that, uh, I almost forgot, you are the only Australian to have been nominated for uh, seven, eight, nine uh, blues music awards, and you actually won the uh, the blues music, the international. Oh gosh, what is it? International blues music challenge a, a few years ago. Yes, well, that was quite a few years ago. Now, the international blues challenge is is uh, an, an inter, as it would sound like an international. Um, music competition for live bands and for solo duo. Uh, there's a solo duo section and it's held in Memphis. Well, of course, things have been a bit disrupted by the pandemic, but, but usually it is, um, it's a huge, uh, it's, a, it's a huge event and attracts a lot of people from all over the world and, and blues fans and all the heats of the competition are held in, uh, on historic Beale Street in Memphis where a lot of my heroes would have played back in the day. So, yeah, that was actually my first trip to America, uh, was representing my Melbourne Blues Society 
in that competition. And I, and I won. I was the first non-American to win. Um, and it really, that was, a, you know, a Cinderella moment where I, I then it, it opened doors for me to go back to America and to make more connections and to tour and, and to make the albums that I've made over there. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a incredible experience. Hey, well, um, and oh, just uh, I was about to say, um, we have someone on the bill called Ray Beadle who represented uh, Australia over there, but didn't quite make the final cut, uh, bless him. Um, but uh, Ray Beadle, I think, is one of the few other Australians who's made it into the finals of the, uh, the, the International Blues Challenge. But hey, I, di- I digress, and um, I've spoken to Ray, so he's had his uh, he's had his moment online. But before I finish, uh, there's a quote that's on your Wikipedia. It's almost in every interview, so I have to bring it up. How did you get to be called Bonnie Raitt's evil twin? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure that actually I, I feel bad because, you know, I, it, you know, I really respect Bonnie Raitt. She's an amazing player and, um, and of course, one of the, the few women who, you know, it, again, in, in a very male-dominated space is, has had such an incredible impact. Uh, but it, it actually was such a compelling quote that uh, my record company couldn't resist it and it's... And it's uh, and yeah, people do respond. It came out of um, a review for one of my um, albums uh, in Midwest Review, a very kind of uh, influential um, magazine that reviews music in the States. And uh, yeah, it's, there's been a few things that uh, I guess ring true. So, so that's why, you know, that they've ended up turning up in my publicity material. And that's, yeah, Bonnie Raitt's evil twin, you know, this is what happens if you have a woman playing guitar but hasn't sort of gone perhaps more mainstream and is really um, in the roots of the music. Uh, and the other one that, that has kind of cropped up quite often um, has been the idea of my album's my recent albums certainly and and my gigs being like a a virtual road trip through different styles and of blues um so yeah that that's kind of been uh been something and i i, I like i like that too maybe it's you know because i'm a gemini and i've got a short attention span i i like <laughs> I, I like the range of stuff it's fun to play too cool well i've uh i've taken up uh a lot of your attention span to keep keep going for this long, Fiona. <laughs> boys, not at all rusty. Thank 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 you so much, and uh, we look forward to seeing the many sides to Fiona. Boys, uh, oh gosh, not that long now, just a few weeks away. So excited! Thank you so much for having me.